Okay, well, uh, I'll bring this meeting to order. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, roll call, I'm here. I can, nope. Are you? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I can see Councilmember Evans is here, Councilmember Watson is here, and we'll go into uh, reports and presentations, personnel update with Chuck. Yes, uh, so as you know, we had a separation last week, uh, Debbie Mills. Um, oh, my fingers. Didn't know that. Yes, uh, her last day was the 7th. And we had um, Joe Lovett, I don't think was mentioned last finance, but he's been promoted from a two to a three in public works. Did have two new employees start since the last finance uh, meeting, and that was Regine, who's the emergency management coordinator, and Casey Maples, who's the new meter reader. Um, we currently have in process a legal specialist one and we have an internal finalized identified and we're hoping to have that person start about April 25th. Uh, we have a building inspector who has a conditional letter and out and we hope to start that person mid-May. Um, we have applications that we're reviewing for a code enforcement officer. We're still looking at applications for a PC network specialist, that's Jason, his last day is Friday. Um, and we're doing ongoing recruitments for public work seasonals. We did have one start today or tomorrow, I believe. Um, in terms of retirements upcoming, John Woodcock hasn't decided yet when he's planning to retire, but we know that's up and coming, along with a number of public works employees. Um, I did hear from the chief, and they have two applicants that he's doing the chief's interview on this week, and they're doing a ride-along with another lateral that may be looking to apply. And uh, if that person does, then he'll they'll do another round for that person before they make a decision. We're very fortunate with those laterals coming yeah. to us. Very we're, fortunate. What a cost savings and goes up very quickly that way. Yep. I think that speaks a lot to our department. Mm -hmm. So do you have applications, job posting for the HR position then? Uh, it's in process. Okay. So just put the requisition through this morning. And I didn't realize that was going on. Is there, um, I guess, anything that we should know about that? Was there a reason that, you know, she decided to move on and we need to find somebody else again so quickly? She separated from service. Okay. Um, Chuck, if you get a chance, uh, can you email that list of things, the personnel update to me? Yes, absolutely. I'll do that. I could not uh, write nearly that fast. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, anybody else? No? Okay. We'll move on to uh, business and action items. AB 22-56, uh, Senior Center Lunch Delivery Drivers. Also, Chuck. It's me, but I'm going to defer to Sue for this one. Hi, Sue. She's on here as well. And you heard my spiel last uh, last finance committee. Great. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure what Chuck said at the last finance committee meeting because I wasn't at that one. But um, we are having, we're serving more lunches. We, we served 113 lunches today. It, it's just, we're blowing the doors off and... With the delivery drivers, we have one gentleman that has been by our side oh. for the last two years who is an unpaid volunteer. Of course, he's an unpaid volunteer. Um, but we're really having a difficult time recruiting and um, maintaining our volunteer force. And I think that if we could offer it as a paid position, it might be easier to um, sustain the, the volunteer, or it wouldn't be volunteers, the drivers. Um, it's a three hour a day commitment. And even if we got people to job share, I don't know that we could get people to job share a 15 hour a, a week position, that it might be more attractive. We're, I'm just grasping at straws trying to get people in here. Uh, it's a program that we developed during COVID and I'm very reluctant to stop delivering meals um, just because we've reopened. 
We're reaching seniors that we were never able to reach before. We're reaching seniors that are will never come into the center. When we reopened, we told all of them, you know, we're open. Why don't you come in? And they're not willing, not able, for whatever reason, they're staying home. And that's 40 to 45 meals a day that we deliver. So that's- Have you thought about what's gonna happen at the end of next year, Sue? Sorry, I have to turn my volume up. What okay. was that? Have you thought about what's gonna happen at the end of next year? Will this have to go on? Oh yeah. You think, or just... This would be indefinite. And how many of these are new clients you never had before? Till this. 95% of these people wow. we reached through COVID. We, I, I don't know most of them. I've never seen them. They are people we reached through COVID. That's amazing. It is. Are they, amazing. All, in the, are they all in the city limits? I would say, you know, Tom, I'm sorry. I really don't know that, but I would okay. I would venture to guess that probably 80% of them are. Um, I don't know how far the city boundaries go up into Prairie Ridge. They don't. They yeah, don't. They don't. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I know that we yeah. have several clients up in the Prairie Ridge area. Um, we divide the boundaries that are between the two routes and and we may end up doing three routes, but it is 410. So we have a North 410 and a South 410 because that's just the logical boundary. Phil is right here. He, he knows both routes very well. If you have any questions that you want answered about, you know, how many people are where I, I can pull him in. So that's about, this, you're about like the food bank, 80% of their clients are in the, in the city of Vine Lake boundaries and the restaurant side. So you're about the same thing you're talking about, okay? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. But I think the, the issue that was brought up uh, at the last meeting in regards to this was really, I think the idea of do we continue you know this this program in that manner since we have opened back up um obviously you want to continue doing this you feel like um you, i think you said 90 like 95 percent or something of, of people you hadn't contacted before yeah that's a lot um is what kind of overlap are you seeing with the food bank we really don't have any partnership with the food bank so i don't know what you're referring to as far as overlap okay uh, I mean, some of these folks might utilize the food bank, but I, I wouldn't know that that number. Um, gotcha. I, I probably could, you know, ask the food bank director, Stacy. Um, I could send her a list of names and ask if any of these folks are her clients, but I, I haven't done that. Okay. We literally serve whoever walks through the door or calls us. I mean, we just, we don't ask questions and that's how it's always been. Our program has always been that way. We just, we don't ask for ID, you know. It, if somebody comes to a senior center, most people under 55 don't come to senior centers. <laughs> they just don't. Um, and that that's our age, you know. We define a senior as being someone over 55. So most of the people in this meeting. <laughs> the club, yeah. What time's lunch? <laughs> John, <laughs> John, Carol and I are going over 1030. <laughs> so, you're, so you're just delivering meals, right? Cook meals. Oh yeah, it's a hot meal okay. at noon. Okay, so Stacy's could be delivering them food for them to cook dinners and weekends or whatever. So that'd be a, kind of a different setup right. between them. Yeah, okay. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the meals, I gave Chuck this number and I don't know if he forwarded it or, or related on to you. Uh, the number of meals that mm -hmm. we're serving and about, I, oh, Hi, sorry. Um, we, in the first quarter of 2020, when we were not delivering meals because we shut down mid-March of 2020, 
we served about 2,800 meals. First quarter of 2021, we delivered and we served, including delivery, 4,400 meals. Oh. The first quarter of this year, we served 5,300 meals. It has exploded. And we, like I said, we serve about, a, about a third of those meals are a third to a half of those meals are delivered. Are you running into issues where food is now an issue? I mean, if your meals are that many more, I'm guessing it's not just delivery that might be an option, but your supply chain and all that? Oh yeah. I am shopping all the time. We go through more food than you could ever imagine. And um, <laughs> I will run into budget issues before the end of the year. You guys shop for yourself at home. You have seen your grocery bills. I, I, you know, you go to the store every other week, you think, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's this much more. It was, you know, $5 last week, it's $7 this week. I'm seeing that with groceries. It's, it's insane how prices have gone up. And we are not serving steak here. We served chicken fritters today, <laughs> I mean, chicken fritters. We served liver and onions last week. That is the cheapest meal you can fix. Right. Still wanna know what time lunch is? <laughs> <laughs> It's a challenge, but you know, part of our part of serving the delivery meals, part of the cost is the styrofoam container that we have to put it in. You now, those are expensive, and the manufacturers have <laughs> they are taking advantage of the demand. On a side note, Sue, the Lanch Kids House and the food bank. Last kids got 30 cases of canned goods last week. <clears throat> and the, the food bank got a truckload of down all up when it was delivering, semi was delivering down there. So if you need some canned goods, I might have some for you. And maybe Stacy does too, because she got quite a bit also. Wow. That's awesome. That truck is full. I couldn't, never thought about you, Sue. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Welcome. <laughs> Well, I guess my my concern is kind of the same as the food bank at this point um, as to where it's going and quite frankly, is it sustainable, you know, long term um, with food prices going crazy with uh, now wanting empl more employees and paid employees and, and that kind of stuff. I just see the, you know, there's only so much money to go around, unfortunately. Sure. So, um, yeah. I, I think all of us would love to just say, yeah, go ahead, you know, absolutely. But I, it's, I think we have to be, you know, somewhat financially responsible here too. So, I'm, that's my concern. Mm -hmm. Well, for, for now, since it's paid for, to the end of the year, then we have to look at it again real hard at the end of the year. Then, it's, it's all a, APRA money, right, Arva? Through twenty three. Through twenty three, yeah, through twenty three. So. Yeah. In the 23, we have a real hard look at that. I'd, I'd suggest that, I mean, we can't do it then because that's going to be in the middle of a budget cycle, but have this come forward as a decision card for 2024 uh, budget because that will be the second year of the next budget to discuss this year. So next year being fully funded, but we discuss it this year to fund for 24 and let the whole council decide from that point. I am fine with this. And, and yeah. nickel and dime the ARPA fund for now. Keep continue doing that. There's a, there's a need. So Tom, you're okay with it, Justin? I'm fine with it. Yeah. Yeah. Like Justin said there's a need right now. So. Okay. As much as everyone wants to lower water rates, I don't want our seniors going hungry. I'd put that as a priority over anything. So. Yeah. And I would say it's funded through November 30th only because um, I have reporting deadlines. So I wanna make sure that, you know, payroll's got a two week lapse. And so I wanna make sure that uh, same with the position that Dina had, uh, we're ending that November 30. Okay. So any uh, ARPA Sherry, funded that, should end November 30. Sherry, that's November 30th, 24. And this was talking about ending 12, 20, uh, 23. 20, 
three, I believe. Is it 24 for yours, Dina? This one's through 23. No, um, I, think mine, I think mine's funded through the end of 24, but I think they're talking about what their proposal is, is through 23. Correct, yes. It does say through 23 on this one. So Sherry, we're okay with December 31st of 23? Yes, yes, if it's 23. Awesome. Okay. And then does this need to go on? What are we, where are we looking at for a, a date for this to go forward? Uh, it would be the next council meeting, April 26th. So just consent or not. I'm okay with consent. I am too. It's up to Terry. Okay. Because he has little concerns. <laughs> uh, yeah, consent's fine. If you guys are good with that, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to the next item, AB 2257, increase for hours, work, senior center, dishwasher, and KitchenAid. Is Chuck or Sue, who wants to do this one? I will. Sue, you're here. <laughs> um, well, this is kind of ties into the increase in meals. Uh, we just need more man hours in the kitchen. Right now we have a very part-time dishwasher funded at 17, 15, 15 hours. 15. And uh, two at 20 hours a week and one at 40 hours a week. And to be honest with you, our full-time cook at 40 is working her panty off. Um, like I said, we served 113 meals today. And one of the 20-hour a week um, positions is vacant. I'm wearing a chef's hat. And it is hard work. I am here to tell you, I have spent way too much time with my fanny in a chair these past several years. Um, it's it is hard work, and with the the limited number of hours that we've got in the kitchen, the man hours we've got in the kitchen, um, we just need more to to perform what we expect of those folks in the kitchen. Now to get those meals done and out the door, we just need them in there more hours. That's cut and dry. I I don't have any problem with this. I mean, the fact that you're getting anyone to work for sixteen dollars an hour right now is, I think, the more remarkable thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine with this. I <clears throat> Sue knows I worked in her kitchen helping out during the holidays and stuff. So I know what they used to have before. So it's busier now, it's a lot of work. It's a real challenge. So that's something we'll have to look in the future for next year's budget and stuff because it's increasing dramatically. And we're talking so, about 10,000, 11,000, 11,000. We served over 12,000 meals last year. Yeah. Well, what do you estimate this year, the point where you're going? Uh, well, we've served a dollar a meal. 5,300 meals in the first quarter, so. Wow. Yeah. At the first quarter, yeah. that would make sense, yeah. Wow. Christmas and Thanksgiving are special yeah. meals, so it's probably. It's... Are you getting more seniors as as John gets older? <laughs> down there? I mean, uh, that just typically increasing and. From I think young... that. I'm not going like to new, <laughs> new seniors coming down there? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, you know, unfortunately, that's the only way that we keep going because on the other end, we have attrition. We have death. Yeah. You know, we lost over 30 seniors in the last two years. Wow. It, it, it was Terrible. really sad. Yeah. It was going to happen. Um, Some people are 70 years old around here. <laughs> it's, it, I believe we lost more because of COVID, not the actual virus, but the social isolation. That didn't surprise me at all. We, that's not average for us to lose 15 people a year. That is not normal at all. But yeah, we've seen a lot of new faces, a, a lot, which is great. Yeah, well, I'm fine with this. I think it's necessary. I mean, yeah. It's a real challenge. So everybody's good with this? 
Yeah. Justin. Yeah. So I'm I'm guessing consent consent as well. Same okay. same date consent. Yep. 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 Got it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. You betcha. Thanks, Sue. Thank you. <coughs> uh, uh, next, oh, go ahead. I know this isn't on your agenda, and I know I did not bring this up to Chuck, but I, I emailed Chuck and John about this. We do have a position that's funded. Um, and I, so, John, is this appropriate time to bring it up? Uh, the three of us will talk about it. Okay, thanks. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right, thank you. Uh, next is the approval of meeting notes for March 22nd. There were some corrections. Dibby has them. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's it. So then uh, open discussion. Uh, the prosecutor's office uh, should apply for a violence against women by fiscal year 2022, improving criminal justice responses to domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking grant. Dina. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, through the U.S. Department of Justice Office on Violence Against Women, there's um, they have a lot of grants that come out. Um, this is a grant that um, could potentially, um, if the city was awarded it, get up to $500,000 um, to be used over a period of 48 months. Um, this, the bulk of what we would want to use it for would probably be to hire a full-time DV advocate and also um, strengthen um, programs in the prosecutor's office in terms of coordinating with victims, victim outreach, um, working with victims to ensure um, they have connections with other agencies that were uh, meeting all of our obligations under um, the Washington state law regarding um, crime victims uh, rights and their um, what they need to be informed of in term of, terms of the criminal justice process. So um, I think we wanted to take this since it um, involves potentially hiring um, another staff member um take it to the finance committee before dedicating staff time to the application process uh, i'm um, sure it's important to right now. yeah i'm just gonna I, i'm just gonna ask terry's question so 48 months from now how are we gonna fund it because it can't go away um so there are people that reapply yeah for the grant again um going through the application um that is I, I assume that that's what happens because that is one of the questions that they're okay they, they ask in the grant so It'd be, um, yeah, applying for another grant or general fund. And it would be like we just did with our emergency management coordinator in the legal specialist position, you know, we specified during mm -hmm. the interview process and then in the uh, offer letters that this was, you know, limited duration funding through date XYZ. What kind of uh, staff time are you expecting? To go through the app to apply? Yeah. Um, I do have some finance they they do have questions um for finance kind of regarding um how funds are accounted and um so i don't know if it would take sherry or whoever would do that maybe an hour or two and then maybe i'd say five to eight hours in the prosecutor's office in terms of writing um the full like narrative of the proposal and clicking through the the grant website i think even if we don't get it it's worth the experience of going yeah. through the application and, and at, at a maximum cost of 20 hours. I mean, I don't, I don't yeah. know that that's really. Have you seen a dramatic forth. increase in this type of crimes coming through your office? <clears throat> I think during COVID, we saw an increase in domestic violence crimes, I think due to the work from home and people being at home more, the surrounding area and city is growing more um, in terms of you know, housing development, not just, I mean, I know Tahali is not part of Bonnie Lake, but just having that housing development out there, you can have incidents that happen at a business, like at the Costco, where there could be a DV incident. And even though they reside outside the city limit, we're prosecuting that case because, and having to deal with that victim because it happened here in the city. Right. My question would be more in regards to uh, if you get the grant, like what are the reporting requirements ongoing for it? Because sometimes those can be onerous. You know, from, I think that, Sherry, do you have any experience with federal grants and the reporting 
I don't know, you might know better the answer in terms of the finance workload. So uh, most every grant we have in the city, uh, the reporting requirements fall back on the department that is awarded the grant. So um, <laughs> finance okay. does not do okay. the reporting okay. other than the federal part of it, which is not a big deal on our side. Yeah, I, I haven't seen a lot of reporting requirements coming up in, in this packet. So I think that in terms of the amount of money it's getting the city compared to the reporting requirements, um, I think it would be a really good benefit to the city. What, what would domestic yeah. violence fall under on the NIBRS? I was just going to ask that because we just got oh, the- yeah, I'm looking at it right here. Because we just got the report from the chief. Do you know what that would fall under? Is it okay if I get yeah, zone totally. to look at your- and I can't remember if there's a sec separate section or not, but the a DV is an, applic an application that you can yeah. put to almost any crime. And, and uh, you so can. you could have a theft or a malmish or an assault. Uh, they could all be considered domestic violence, right? So there's there's a lot of potential or aggressive. Hard to classify so as well. Any of those assaults could potentially be um, a domestic violence okay. charge. Um, violation of a no contact order is almost always. Um, and theoretically, um, as Deputy Mayor Carter said, you can you can add DV actually literally to pretty much any charge. There was even recently a case decision on an animal cruelty case where they added a so, DV, yeah. a DV um, designation to that. And technically speaking, the Washington State Crime Victim Rights Law applies to any victim. Um, so even like a victim of like a theft, um, there are um, rules regarding how much outreach we have to have to that person. Domestic violence, because of the nature of domestic violence, there's a lot more that goes into it. Um, just on the NIBRS report for you, Terry, um, yeah. simple assault, if, if that's what we're classifying it at, for January and February this year, we had 19 compared to last year, the same time frame was seven, so we're more than double, two and a half times over what we were in that time frame. I think that's pretty uh, pretty standard across the all cities and counties at this point right now. Yeah. Unfortunately. Um, I I don't have a problem with this. I think it's uh, it's great. I, anytime you can find a grant and get some some money uh, to help us uh, do a better job, I think is a great opportunity. So. Um, Thank you for looking into this. I just had that question because, yeah, sometimes there is reporting requirements that can be kind of a pain. But um, for the amount of money, I think, yeah, it's, it's probably worth doing whatever they want. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, so, so what what I'd suggest is just a, an agenda bill with a motion of the council, you know, directing staff to make the application. Okay. Yeah. And is that okay with the consent agenda, Terry? Yeah, I think so. That would be good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else for open discussion? Dina, oh, sorry. Yeah, Dina have one. Dina have one more. Um, okay. So um, there. This is the opioid uh, settlement memorandum of understanding. Um, basically, there's a law firm that, on behalf of uh, Washington State local government, um, is suing the big three op opioid distributors and manufacturers. So they're really big, like pharmaceutical companies. Uh, they don't have a settlement reached yet, but they're anticipating one. And so um, kind of a, a cousin of a, like a class action lawsuit where, you know, you fill out your postcard and maybe you get like a check for $5, except I think this is going to be more than $5. <laughs> um, basically, Bonnie Lake is anticipated under the settlement agreement to get 12% of that settlement agreement. Um, in order to get it, the city has to sign the memorandum of understanding and then there are a list, um, there's a 12 page list of items that the city can spend the money on. And it's a pretty, I think a, a generally a generous uh, list of things that can be spent on something like a public works project, like potholes, but um, you know, it could be spent on anything, you know, law enforcement or uh, prosecution is even. Would this be similar to what then Attorney General Gregoire did with the tobacco industry? I might be dating myself, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe I'm the one dating myself. Then if, if. 
So that was back in the two, early, long time ago. early 2000s <laughs> as Attorney General. She sued the, the tobacco oh, market and got a large settlement from that as a state. Okay. That would be awesome if it was that kind of money. But yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't know. I'm not taking Dean to lunch at the senior. <laughs> no, not, not any time. Clearly isn't. Oh, but if you need a driver. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, he just can't make it back. But possibly, yes. Okay. <laughs> They'd be great. You know, okay. I'm sure we use the important things the city that way. Yeah. And Dina, we do have to sign it by the end of the month. Yeah, the, the law firm is yeah. asking to sign it by the end of the month. So I think it could go on the April 26th. 26th yeah. Did, did you see any negatives to doing this? Oh, I don't see. I, I mean, I don't see any negatives. The big negative to not signing it is that if they settle, you, your funds get distributed to the other cities. So right. you, they're trying to incentivize cities to sign it. Okay. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Okay, okay with the cons consent agenda? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Consent, sounds good. Okay, uh, any other open discussion? I don't have any. I'm good. You're good, everybody's good. Okay. Uh, I'm good. So I guess with that, we are adjourned. See you later. You. See, you, See you, Sherry. See you tonight. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good.